Number one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Tremendous show, tremendous success. Hello everyone, it's Mark the Statman Skevich from Real Fans Real Talk on realfansrealtalk.com here with the legendary New York Nick, Anthony Mason. And now this is pretty big for me because interviewing somebody that I grew up watching while I was falling in love with basketball is very big, so I'd like to thank you for coming on the program. Um, let's take it back to the beginning. What made you fall in love with the sport of basketball? Actually, I was a basketball, I was a baseball and football player, and um, I didn't play basketball until my junior year in high school. I uh, I moved, I grew up in Manhattan, 186 between Amsterdam and Audubon, and uh, that was baseball area, and then I moved to Jersey, which was football and baseball, and then I ended up moving back to New York, and I moved to Queens, and I was like, let's play some uh, football and baseball. They was like, we well, don't play no football and baseball here, so I just decided to try the sport. I figured since I had a little height, I should be all right. <laughs> so uh, Definitely a lot more than all right when it was all said and done. Um, you went to the University of uh, Tennessee State University, excuse me, and not the typical situation in the NBA where someone goes to college, gets drafted, and then has a career in the NBA. Uh, you were drafted by the Blazers in the third round, uh, didn't play for them. You played uh, in Turkey and Venezuela and for the CBA and the um, USBL. So it was, it was a long, and of course, street ball too. You were a very famous street baller. What was it like um, to keep that drive going to eventually make it to the NBA? Well, I've always been a competitive person. I've always wanted to be the best at whatever I did. So if I was uh, pitching nickels, I would have tried to be the best. And since I decided to play the sport, um, I wanted to be one of the best and you get a lot of practice in New York. New York City is a basketball city and um, everybody dreams about, you know, be, going pro or whatever play, or whatever the case may be, but not many get that opportunity and once it becomes a reality, then I just put forth all my effort. Uh, you know, one thing I'm famous for is my work ethic and I just kept working and uh, being the best I could be, adding stuff to my game and, you know, becoming a name in the NBA. What was it like as far as like family and friends during that time? Were you getting uh, negative uh, feedback to telling you to quit and, and give up on your dream of the NBA? No, my family's always been very supportive and uh, my mother was always, you know, be one to say, whatever you be, be the best at it. You know, she, her famous line was, if you're going to be a garbage man, be the best garbage man out there. So when I decided to try to play basketball, I remember I was leaving off to college and I looked back, I said, Mom, I'm going to make the Mason name a household name. And, you know, just like any mother, she's like, I know, baby, sure, you're going to do it. And, uh, but she always supported me and always uh, pushed me to be the best at whatever I chose to do. And when you did make it to the NBA again, you played for the uh, New Jersey Nets and then the uh, Denver Nuggets, but you didn't really get a chance to shine at that point. Uh, three games here and then eventually in 91 going to the Knicks with Pat Riley. Do you think Pat Riley was a, a key factor in you elevating your game to the next level? I believe that anybody giving you an opportunity is going to be responsible for any success you have. So, yes, the fact that he took a chance on me being a legend already at the time, you know, and I was, a, you know, a guy from Tennessee State, you know, he didn't buy into the, you had to be from, you know, Kansas or Kentucky. But one thing I respect and love about Pat Riley is, He's going to put the best thing on the floor. He don't care where they're from, what their background is. And a lot of people don't do that no more. Everybody's caught up in the hype. And uh, I respect the opportunity he gave me, and I just want to make him proud. My co-host Trip Young in his interview talked about this. And as a diehard Knicks fan, the uh, vision is still, uh, and the audio is still implanted in my brain. Smith, Smith, rebound, Smith, Smith, stop the game. From Marv Albert, uh, in that moment, there's, there was a lot of, horrific moments as a Knicks fan what would you say was the one you, you had John Starks in game six of the 94 finals, finals you have the Patrick Ewing mixed layup was there any one of those that particularly hurt the most uh, they did a trade in 96 that kind of that hurt the that most. was the, I was getting to that I was that getting was to probably, that next that was probably what hurt the most you know everything else 
is a part of the game. You know, I, I was sat down and told I was going to be a nucleus here, and, you know, the next year I was gone. So, if anything, that hurt the most. You know, like I said, anything else, I mean, we can't make all our shots as much as we wish we could. Uh, we can't do it. We can't stop somebody every time, even though I, I tried to and probably was the best that ever did it. But, um, you know, that's just part of basketball. So, the trade was probably one of the biggest hurting moments for myself. All right. And you were sixth man of the year in 1995. Uh, you had the big six-man role as a New York Nick. And a lot of people, like myself, felt that you should have been a starter at the time, which you eventually did the following year. But what was it like ta taking that role as opposed to a starting role? I got a funny story about that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mind coming up the bench because I always felt that I had an advantage. I uh, I get to watch what's going on. I get to see who's hot, who's not. Does he have a left? Does he have a right? Uh, you know, what's his strength? You know, what's his weakness? And I remember one time, uh, <laughs> the same year you're talking about, Oakley went and got surgery. And, uh, of course, my minutes had to step up. I ended up starting just enough games not to be over the six man, or, you know, whatever that whatever that is. And I remember uh, Pat Riley called me into the locker into the office, and he said, uh, "What do you think about starting?" And I said, "Well, you know, um, coming off the bench give me an advantage, and um, you know I get to see the strengths and the weaknesses, and I get to see you know who's going left, who's going right. You know, I feel like I'm better coming off the bench, um, and you know, and I can take that role because you know I wasn't worried about my minutes because I was still one of the leading minute you know getters or whatever the case may be." So I said that, and he let me do my whole spiel, and then he said, you know, that's the most bullshit <laughs> I ever heard. And then he said, uh, if you play, you start, you come off the bench, you got to be ready either way. And from then on, I never looked back. So once again, I respected that about Riley. He, he can motivate you. He can, he have you probably was the most prepared coach I've ever seen in my life, you know from number standpoint, from what somebody, the opposing team ate for breakfast, he, he would know it. So I, I'll never forget that story right there. <laughs> well, the, the following year after the sixth man of the year, you did actually have the most minutes in the league and uh, a, a franchise Knicks record for most minutes in a season. So you definitely get the, you did get the starting role that we see. You know, a lot of Knicks fans like myself felt that you deserved. Uh, now we're getting chronologically to the point where you you did get hurt by the trade. Why do you think that the Knicks uh, traded? I didn't agree with the trade. Larry Johnson, he had the four-point play. He had a lot of good Knicks moments. But, uh, you know, Grandma Ma and everything was, had his back injury before coming to the Knicks. Wasn't too excited about it. Why do you think that trade happened? I don't think nobody really agreed with the trade except the people that did it. Um, but I have no clue. You know, and one thing I would say, you know, to my to my man Shump, who's like my little brother, and and people whose name is rumored in trades, you know, back then I was upset. I was young. I'm at home. You know what you trade me for? But I found out it's part of the business. And usually when your name comes up in trades, it's not so much the team getting rid of you. It's so much, you know, might be the team is the most you the most desirable to other teams. You know, you might look elsewhere and be like, well, I don't want nothing else. That's what I want. You know, so. You got to look at it both ways. At that time, I couldn't see that way. You know, I was mad or whatever the case may be. So I, I really never asked nobody what was the reason. You know, I always my motto was uh, either you play with me or you play against me. You had some good years. Uh, your highest two years points per game wise uh, with the Hornets, as you mentioned in Trip Young's interview, you got to be more involved offensively. Uh, the next step was uh, the Heat being reunited uh, with Pat Riley. And um, um, there were high expectations at that time. And uh, Alonzo Mourning had his uh, uh, kidney issues, I believe, at the time. What was it like for the Heat organization at that time? Because a lot of people felt that, you know, there was the possibility of going far at that time. You know, it's funny, you know, like you said, they was expecting us to <clears throat> do it all. That's one thing about Riley, as you see, he, he can build a team. And when Alonzo went down, you know, all of a sudden, by media standards, uh, that's it. You know, Miami can forget it. They're going to be in the bottom. And and when you got a guy like Riley and and some of my teammates and myself, that that's nothing but a challenge. You're like, really? You're going to be in the bottom because he went down? So we just we just tightened up our bootstraps and 
for far forever. And I think we end up getting the fourth spot um, and show people that, you know, just because one person goes down, you can put a concentrated effort out on the floor and do good things. And the next team on your journey, the Milwaukee Bucks, when you joined them, once again, high expectations. Uh, the previous year, they were one game shy of making the NBA Finals. They had uh, the talent of uh, Ray Allen, a.k.a. Jesus Shuttlesworth, as uh, Trip Young likes to remind uh, everybody. Uh, Glenn Robinson, Sam Cassell, and then you're added to the mix. So once again, they're feeling that there's going to be uh, a championship team. But there was a media... Um, problems with uh, saying that you had problems with George Carl and you were criticizing the team. They ended up finishing, um, you know, at 500, I believe, 41 and 41. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those Bucks days and uh, the media um, saying that there was problems as far as you uh, criticizing teammates? I don't remember going 41 and 41 with nobody, but uh, I think we're better than that. But uh I didn't have a I didn't have a problem with uh Carl. What I did have a problem with was I never seen a bunch of stars sit out of practice for no reason, and um, the Allen Iverson move. And I remember one time I was like, "Oh man, we're going into a game without the big three. and they're like, "No, nah, they're right." And I was like, "That was my criticism of Carl." You know, I you, when you're about around somebody like Pat Riley, where Patrick Ewan doesn't sit down, how how can these three guys sit down? You know, because their toe hurts or they're tired or something like that. So that was kind of my my spirit was kind of down. You know, it's funny that everybody calls it criticism or complaining when you're just telling the truth. You know, you brought a winner in there. You brought a guy who's, uh, I think, in the high 60s or maybe 70 or over 70% of winning, you know, in my whole career. And I've been with winning coaches and coaches that wouldn't allow that. And when I was a star of the team, I never did it. So I wasn't used to coming in and watching people sit down without really being hurt or sick or whatever the case may be. So that that was my complaint about that, you know, and then there was some internal stuff that didn't have nothing to do with me, but I just watched people act real unprofessional. Well, I can't say unprofessional, but, but doing stuff that, you know, I would never, you know, like complaining to the owner and stuff like that and the owner actually coming down, addressing it. I've never seen that like that, so. It was just a strange run organization. What was the reason for your retirement? Was Did you, because of the things that you saw going on, was it something that, uh, you know, since the, the, all the changes in the game and seeing things like that in practice where the, the stars are sitting out for, you know, because their toe hurts and things like that? Well, I honestly say my spirit wasn't into it, but I remember them saying, I think, uh, the point guard used to be at Portland. Terry uh, Porter got the job, and uh, he was like, we're going to go in a younger fashion. So my agent asked him, they like, well, if they can't outplay him, then what? We're still going to go, you know, with younger guys, you know, even if I'm better. So I was like, you know, I, I really must, that's another unprofessional thing or strange organization run. Why wouldn't you put the best on the floor? And um, so we just mutually agreed that they buy me up. I felt that the Knicks, the reason why they go off to their great start last year is because of their depth in the big man position because we noticed um, when Wallace went down, Thomas went down, Camby went down, um, you know, that winning streak started to slow down. And those obviously aren't the superstars on the team, but they do bring that veteran experience. They do bring that depth in the big man position, and there aren't too many big mans out there. So to have some depth, um, do you think that was one of the factors with the Knicks? Because we're looking at them struggle now with Chandler's injury. Do you think that uh, the Knicks need more depth in the big man position? Um, I don't know if I actually say that was the problem or that was the reason for the win streak. I believe. Uh, well, a lot of other other factors, but added to soon as Woodson took over the job the year before. Total change. Wasn't as good, wasn't, you know, going to win no championship. But you see, you saw the concerted effort to play defense. And when they came out the block the next season, it was a concerted effort to play D. Yeah, they had more bigs, but I, I predicted all of them was going to get hurt. I mean, it was just, you know, they were too old at the time or whatever the case may be. But there was a lot more effort. There was more toughness, more meanness, more togetherness as far as getting a goal accomplished. And right now, you just don't see that. And um, I kind of attribute it to the league, seeing the way they play, figuring it out, and just, you know, playing against it. Plus, you get rid of Novak, 
who's a lights out shooter and you don't add nothing like that, you know, you know, people say, uh, well, he didn't play D. How many people on the Knicks play D? Yeah, Barniani didn't really, uh, wasn't really I mean, much of Chandler's an upgrade. Chandler's an okay defender. I mean, Chandler's more of a good, a great help defender, but you see a post play on him, he doesn't really, you know, shut him down. So, I mean, there's really no great defender. So you get rid of Novak because he's a liability on defense means what? You know, he, he could spread that floor. And, you know, that's what he was getting all the drives down the paint and getting the threes. Now you all you got to do is pack the paint and, you know, rebound and go the other way. All right. Um, the game then versus now, all the rules changing uh, with the hand checking. Uh, you mentioned it in Trip Young's interview. Do you think it's a fair comparison, even if LeBron James gets more rings than Jordan, or you know, because of the game changing then versus now, to even be making the comparison to Jordan? I think it's very unfair, but this is what I say. Jordan was playing now. If we was playing now, the games would be six hours long. We'd stay on the free throw line, and it would be the most boring thing you ever seen in history. So, yes, it would be totally unfair. You know, you know, you could say, "Oh, the hand checking is gone." Why is the hand checking gone? They needed they needed that taken away. They it was too much. You know, they couldn't handle it. What was, what's the change for? You know, you say you want more scoring, but keep it real. When was the Boston game exciting? I mean, people scoring 132, 130, is that really exciting? From what fan standpoint? When you're a hard worker, blue collar, when somebody get in the trenches, that's not exciting to me. Watching people just run up and down and jack the ball up, no defense, nothing down the trenches. You can't bump into nobody. You can't impede their progress. I mean, yeah, you go to the hole and I'll go to the hole. I, I think it's, I think it's going to get worse, worse too. I think they still think it's too physical. <laughs> and now you do have two sons in the game, Junior and uh, Antoine. Um, Junior obviously uh, didn't get drafted into the NBA. Do you think that uh, one day, like you, he's going to stick with it and eventually get his shot? I think so. He's in the D League now with Sioux Falls. Uh, I don't know if I would have picked that team for him because that's Miami's team, and I don't know if they're really looking. We're just trying to get him to the uh, Erie team, which is the Knicks, because they need – you know, resurrection, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, if he sticks out, he sticks with it and, you know, keep working hard. I think he has a shot. I mean, I watch the league and I know talent wise, he can play in it, um, with ease, but you know, sometimes it's about the right situation, the right time. You know, it's not always, it's not always a, a direct way. It's not always a, not always a formula to it. You know, people, when I made pro, if you go back to my high school with teammates, they were like, you made pro on what? <laughs> basketball? If it was football or, bas or baseball, I, we could see it, but basketball? So it's God's plan, man. And I think when I had to go the long route, it made me, appre made me appreciate it more. And I wasn't going back, you know, once I got a foot in the door. So hopefully that works out for him the same way. Training your kids growing up, I saw in the, the special that they had with Tim Hardaway uh, tr uh, training uh, – Tim Hardaway Jr. in the younger years, he was kind of hard on him in the sense that he wasn't motivated uh, at, anymore for the game. Like, what what advice do you have for other athletes, and what did you do with your kids as far as getting them involved to the game, but also not make it something where it feels like a job and they hate it? Well, I mean, Tim Hardaway and myself only know how to do it one way. Uh, we only know how to be hard on them because we know, you know, all the kids see the glory and the, the cars and the jewelry and the women and, and stuff like that. And they think it's an easy trek to the NBA and it's not. So I said, if this is really what you want, I'm going to show you what it takes to get there. And it's hard work. I don't care if you're great. I don't care, you know, even a great player. They say LeBron works hard. They say Kobe worked hard. Jordan worked hard. I mean, it's, it's not an easy trek as people think it is. You know, you're only playing basketball. Okay, but how many basketball players have we all seen that we thought was the world's greatest, didn't even get into the first door, didn't even go to school? So it's not an easy trick. So I think it's only one way to – that's what's wrong with the whole NBA now and the whole world premise now is we got to be softer. We got to be more lenient. If you want people to be accountable, you got to stay on them. You got to be hard on them. And then they'll appreciate it more. They'll, it becomes easier because you'll only work hard. You'll only give maximum effort. Then it becomes easier. If you halfway do it, it's always going to be hard. You're always going to get hurt. 
You're not going to get the minutes you want to get. You're going to wonder why you're not playing. Those are the problems that come from being lenient and so. All right. And one other question. Um, coming into the league, now they have their uh, new rule where you have to play at least uh, one year of college or take one year off from high school before getting into the NBA. How do you feel about that rule? Me personally, you know, you know, all of them gonna hate me, but I think that it should be like football. I think you should have to finish your junior year for for two reasons. One, their body will get a chance to mature, and you know, if you notice, that's why. What's the percentage of all the young guys coming out that actually have a long career or become anything in the NBA? They get hurt and their careers is over. If you go to your junior year, your body's more mature, more mature, and secondly. You go that far, you might as well go for your degree. So most people are going to be like, man, I might as well stay one more year. So you have people completing and getting their degree, and then on the financial side or, or the lifestyle side after, they make more educated decisions. You, you're given a one year out of the uh, one year out of the um, college is like a high school player, and you're giving them twenty, thirty million, fifty million, and telling him to make wise decisions. I never will forget when everybody got mad at Kobe for. Speaking about uh, speaking out on uh, Shaq that time when he got in trouble, and everybody went ballistic. But they forgot this is a high school kid you let really? come into the league. He's doing what high school kids do. We, you know, you was telling you was you know you didn't want to be by yourself. Now he's one of the best teammates and mo most mature you know guys in the league. But that's what happens when you when you do that. I think everybody should have to at least finish three years. With college, with any sport, not just basketball. Um, do you feel that college athletes should get paid because of the fact of how much money they bring into their universities? I don't know if I would say pay like a salary, but they shouldn't want for nothing. You understand what I'm saying? If they need clothes, they should be able to get it. If they, you know, don't want to eat cafeteria food and want to eat, you know, better food, they should be able to get it. They shouldn't want for anything. You know, it's... It should be no more poor kids in college, you know, because you got to follow the rule. These teams are making millions and millions off of them, and uh, you're not giving up anything, or you, you know, you're giving something that doesn't even compute. So I don't know if I would say here go your check as a salary, but there's nothing that they uh, that they should want. And uh, you're in the financial services industry now. Uh, what advice do you have for the young athletes uh, coming into the league now? The fact that economics is an elective um, and social studies and science is uh, mandatory, I, I would tell these athletes, take economics. You know, learn about your credit score. Learn about building your credit up. Learn that, um, you know, about where to put your money in. So then when you go get these business managers and agents, if they're not saying the right things that you need to hear, you, you'll recognize it. You know, you get so many guys caught with the wrong guy because they don't know what to hear. They don't know what to listen. I watched my mother work two jobs and, um, you know, work her butt off and check the check. She didn't know nothing about annuities or a CD or this or that. But if you if you get the financial education early, you know, I'm not saying it's 100%, but at least you'll know what, to, you know what to look for. You know the decisions to make. I think that should become mandatory more so than when Columbus discovered America. You're definitely right about that. One last question. I mean, I could talk all day with you, but I know you do got, have other things to do. But you were a great defender in the league. Who would you say was the uh, toughest uh, athlete to defend? Well, it's funny because it, I don't think it was a tough athlete. I think it was a combination. And I always say it was Carl Malone because he had Stockton. Uh, if Carl Malone was in the position, the ball was right there on time, you know, perfect position. Uh, Stockton goes to the bench and... He wasn't the same player. He wasn't as hard to check. But I would have to say, because of that combination, it probably was Carl Malone. All right. All right, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Mark the Statman Skevich alongside the legend, all-star, sixth man of the year, Anthony Mason. Thank you for joining us, uh, Anthony. It was definitely a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Tremendous show, tremendous success.